And now moving on to our third presenters, L and L, who've also been called Mr. and Mrs. Ungava. Lynette Chubb is an artist and has done a great job of being able to meld her two loves of art and paddling and canoeing. We're going to learn about a trip of theirs in Angava. And also Latslo Kovac, who, uh, Latslo Kovac. <laughs> and um, if you want to go on a trip with him, you should figure out a way to bring bread or get really good at baking bread. Um, but if you really want to woo and wow Lynette, then it's all about catching fish and cooking them and especially cooking extra crispy fish skin. So for those of you who are like me who don't like fish skin, she'd be a good person to share a fish with. Um, and they've traveled with all kinds of different people. Lynette particularly likes the windbound days, which is uh, one of her pleasures on a trip that supports one of her partner's pleasures on a trip, but you'll have to ask him personally about what that is on those windbound days. <laughs> and so I'd like to introduce them. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Ungava Peninsula, also known as Nunavik, is the very northern tip of Quebec, Canada. Uh, I, I need I need that. I need it. Lynette and myself have spent many long summers vacation exploring, documenting, and mapping many canoe routes in Ungava. Our trip reports and maps can be found online if you Google LNL trips as one word. In the summer of 2014, a group of six paddlers, three men and three women, crossed from west to east, taking five weeks to go up Kogaluk River from the Hudson Bay side, then over the height of land to Payne Lake, and finally down the Payne River to the Inuit village of Kangirsuk on the Ungava side. As far as we know, we were the third canoe expedition who have done this, and the first expedition which included women. Uh, the first expedition was in, in 1948. It was a scientific expedition led by Jacques Rousseau. There were four scientists. Um, geologist, geographer, botanist, and filmmaker. And you can find uh, their video, about 20 minutes documentary, online in the National Film Board website. It's all available for free, just to view. They were accompanied by two Inuit from Povernituk and four Montagna guides from Settils. And they went up the Kogaluk to Tassiad Lake. From there, since there were very few useful maps of the area, they tried to follow a compass bearing to the cache they had dropped on, at Payne Lake. In the National Film Board documentary, Crossing Arctic Ungava, they called this a 20-mile portage, but in reality it was largely lake hopping, with two Inuit returning west after they reached Payne Lake. The second expedition was paddled by Hideaway Canoe Club in 1990. These four men veered off Rousseau's route at Lake Anartalik, where they continued up the Peronel River. From Lake Anuk, uh, they went through a series of portages directly to east, uh, east to Lake Barvillier, and from there again through a series of portages northeast to Payne Lake. Now, if I can get this. Uh, we, in, logistically, we couldn't start at the, at the bay of the Kogaluk, so we wanted to start at the Peronel River, just a little bit south and make through these lakes up and cross the ridge to the Kogaluk River. That was the plan. Now, what happened, uh, Air Inuit had in their database wrong uh, coordinates for the runway, for the landing strip. So instead of dropping us here, as was the plan, they dropped us here. <laughs> so it was a very interesting start of the trip. And we wasted basically one very, very hard portaging day, crossing somehow through here and then lake hopping and getting us across. In general, we followed the, the Hideaway Canoe Club route, but from Lake Anuk, uh, we devised our own route. 
which we follow, we try to follow the rivers and creek as much as possible, thus only having to portage altogether about 15 kilometers of entire 620 kilometer route. And this is our crew. From the left, uh, this is Eric, our driver, who helped us tremendously logistically, and six paddlers. So from the left, there is a Chris Rush, doctor from Montreal, who made the video you will see soon. Next, actually. That's Selena than me. There is Iva Kinslova, Jenny Johnson, and Lee Session. And you probably noticed uh, that Eva and Lee already were shown in the previous show by Brian. And they are also here, so we can say hi to them during the break. Okay. So during the time restriction, we will show you portions of the overall video, which is compiled by Chris. And uh, then we will conclude with a few last photos afterwards. Okay. So. On every canoe expedition, there seems to be one day where foul weather and circumstances necessitate stopping at what one can call a desperation camp. It happened on day 17 of this trip. Pounding rain, a bitter cold wind, reduced visibility, 
and pending hypothermia necessitated stopping at the small rapids connecting the north and south sections of Barvillier Lake. What's going on? It's raining, it's the end of the day and everybody is tired and everybody is freezing. It's kind of hypothermic evening, <laughs> so we are enjoying. So. A makeshift campsite was found, protected by a bluff, with enough room for the tents, which were quickly erected after a short portage. We're all wet. Is there anybody crying? No, not a soul. Well, I, I'm going to bed, seriously. I'm like, I'm cold, I'm wet. Here's Jen. Jen, how's the weather? Cold and wet. Cold and wet? <laughs> or really wet. Wet, wet, wet. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's just like Oregon weather, but wetter and colder and windier. <laughs> Oregon. <laughs> Nice weather for cool pictures outside. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like it? It's really wonderful. We became windbound at this camp for two nights as the wind picked up and blew from the north the next day. Rapid between Barvillier Lakes. <laughs> there is a fish inside. Fish. Lots of fish. So, uh, Chef, what's on the menu tonight? We have pasta with sun-dried tomatoes and pine nuts and some fresh cheese along with some freshly caught lake trout. And uh, who caught the lake trout? I did. <laughs> I caught it. Excellent. The gen is being corrupted. For sure. Hoping to find evidence of Viking culture, Norse longhouses in the area of Payne Lake where we hope to get to very soon. We planned the final height of land route to cross into the Payne River watershed. No one knew the exact route of the 1948 expedition but we were sure it was nowhere near where we were. The 1989 expedition had taken a more northern route to access the lakes that marked the change in watersheds. Head guide Latso Kovac wanted to try a series of small lakes that appeared to be connected by streams in order to access the Payne watershed. A stone cairn was erected 
to mark Camp Desperation. On the morning of July 24th, the wind dropped. An early start was planned for four o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock, 4 a.m. start. We're three days behind. We're a little anxious that we're not gonna make it on time, so early start. Wind finally broke, it's at our back now. And uh, a little bit of lake travel and then uh, big portage to get over the height of land. Wish us luck. We're heading north, see if we can make it to the height of land today. Maybe even to Payne Lake. On the last portage into Payne Lake, there was a sense of relief. It's all downhill from here.
and the first 20 kilometers of this huge 80 kilometer long lake went well, allowing us to celebrate crossing the height of land that evening at dinner. In our dry suit, look, we have a new person with us. <laughs> Jen, what are you drinking? Irish whiskey. Why? We made it over the height of land today, <laughs> and we're in Payne Lake, and we made smiles. Time to celebrate. <laughs> yeah. That's why. <laughs> but we woke the next morning to our old friend, the wind, howling from the northeast the worst possible direction. This meant another windbound day. We have a break in the weather. The wind is only, uh, what, 30 kilometers an hour instead of 80? Yeah. After a long, hard slog into the wind, our bodies just gave up. Some treats were, however, waiting for us at the camp. The first, wild mushrooms. The second, yet another gorgeous sunset. The next day was much of the same. One to two kilometers per hour of progress. At this point, we had traveled less than half the mileage needed on the voyage to get to Kangersuk. Yet, there was talk by some of stopping and trying to wait out this vicious wind. A decision had to be made. We had 40 kilometers of big lake travel left, as well as 280 kilometers of basically unknown river to paddle. Um, him and I could get off this lake in three days and shoot the pain in eight days, no problem. So we could make his flight and my flight um, if we stick as a group and it takes us a week to get off here, uh, we're looking at a, probably three to four thousand dollars each to get an airlift, Lee and I, uh, back to Kujuak to make his flight on time. Which is okay. I would like to finish the river though, I don't want to quit halfway through it. We're not even halfway through it. I'm willing to push. Um, I'm I'm not willing to push Going doing backwards. zero kilometers no, neither, an hour. Neither yeah. am I. Yeah. I don't have to. Yeah. But it's unfair to ask other people to do that. Yeah. I personally would prefer to stay as a group and if we've got to bust our asses. Oh, 
I'm hanging out in my little wind shelter. Is it windy? Out there it is, but right here it isn't. Because I have a nice wind break. Right here. Right there. Well, we're gonna head up the lake. We're still trying to get off this bloody pain lake, and the wind has not been particularly cooperative, but we've been slogging our way little by little, like one or two kilometers at a time, sometimes through a couple foot waves, and we're very thankful that we have the covers on, because otherwise, we'd have really wet butts. In fact, we got wet butts anyhow. Uh, it, looks, it looks bad day today, pretty big waves and stuff. We are able to go next seven, eight kilometers, but I'm afraid what's gonna be after. So maybe we'll have to do another night paddle, and uh, this time we got our headlamps out. We're being proactive, so we can set up camp in the dark now. Yeah. Um, these are the outlet rapids. There's about two kilometers of pretty heavy-duty rapids, and we elected to portage past that, and that was our last um, real portage. Um, we were accompanied by black flies and we ended up surprising a pack of white wolves who disappeared too fast for our cameras. From here on, the weather improved and the current of the Payne River helped us to finish safely and on time. Dwelling sites and markers of both Inuit and Viking origins can be found all along the entire crossing. We found and explored the Viking settlement sites on Payne Lake that Rousseau had documented, but which have been ignored and swept under the rug by Canada in order to protect Canada's sovereignty in the north, we think. Uh, we also camped again at the site of another Viking monument, the Hammer of Thor. The Payne is huge with powerful tidal currents for the last few days that paddlers need to respect. We paddle on the high and slack tides to reach Kangersuk a day early. Our complete trip report and maps can be found online at our website if you type L and L trips as one word into Google Sites. Thank you. Thank you very much to L&L and enjoy your break. We'll see you back here shortly for the next session. Thank you.